Welcome to the Fit Girl Magic Podcast. If you are ready to find your inner magic, develop great habits, and a rock steady mindset to feel confident, comfortable, and fit in your body, you are in the right place. I am Kim Barnes Jefferson, and I'll be giving you weekly doses of health, fitness, and life tips sprinkled with humor and real talk. If you're ready to be consistent without the stress of perfection, magic makers, it's time to slip into your favorite pair of PJs, grab some coffee, kick back, and listen to today's show. Hey, Magic Makers, I am so excited today. I have Dr. Herman Weiss here, and we did such a deep dive on PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome. And, you know, through I knew that it was a big thing, but I didn't realize that over 70% of women have PCOS. And it's one of the top endocrine disruptors for women. And it often goes undiagnosed or misdiagnosed. And Dr. Weiss did such a great job of unpacking the three causes or the three uh, types of PCOS that you could possibly have. And he went through in-depth, holistic approaches to how you can manage it from your um, mental kind of self-care is the best way to describe it, your nutrition, as well as your relationship with food. All all the things that I talk about, he just kind of dovetailed right into everything that you've heard shared on this show previously. And the best thing about him is that he shared that as a doctor, he's looking for a partnership, right? That how, you know, come in armed with questions so that you guys can co-create your health versus sitting there and waiting for the doctor to like, you know, tell you exactly what to do. And that was just how I've been working with my doctors. And it it just has changed my whole outlook on my approach to health. I know you're going to get something out of this. And do me a favor, if you do get something out of this, screenshot it and make sure you tag myself and Dr. Weiss and just let us know what your number one takeaway was. So thanks and enjoy the show. All right, I want to thank Miss Clara B. Lee from the Philippines. I've gone international, y'all. She leaves a great review here for me. She says so many valuable health tips that you can learn from. It is a must listen. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much. Again, I appreciate every single review that comes my way. It tells me that I'm giving you the information that you're looking for, the information that you're yearning for. I know that when I was in my, you know, perimenopausal journey, I just was like, where can I turn to? What information can I find? And I'm grateful that I am giving that to you. These reviews mean the world to me. They light me up that I'm able to uh, help you in any way possible. So if you are listening to this, do me a favor, head over to iTunes and leave me a review. If you're like, girl, I don't know how to do that. Reach out to me. I will help you get that done. Have a great day and enjoy the rest of the show. Magic Makers, you know, I absolutely love when I can find great resources for you. And today I have found a great resource. I'm talking to Dr. Herman Weiss and we're talking about PCOS, but we're also talking about how PCOS may have impacts on to menopause. And Dr. Weiss has spent his life as an OBGYN as well, working on how do women deal with hormone abnormalities. And I don't know about you, but so many women I come across we're doing fine, but then all of a sudden we get this curveball thrown at us and our doctors are kind of like, oh, uh, I don't know what to do with you. And so that's where we have Dr. Weiss here for those people who like get that pregnant pause and feel like they're off chasing their tail. Dr. Weiss, please welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much, Kim. I love the energy. Uh, I listened to a few of your podcasts already and I was uh, very excited to be here and channel some of that positivity. Um, awesome. You know, it's yeah, it's funny when you, you know, when you say PCOS and polycystic ovary syndrome, you know, you think of a young, you know, a young, a reproductive age uh, population. But uh, but in, in all honesty, you, you know, a lot of women go through life undiagnosed. In fact, yes. about 70, 70 percent of patients and, it, it, you know, go undiagnosed. Uh, it's the number one reproductive uh, endocrine disorder in women um, at, by far, uh, by far. If you have a you know a room of 100 women, you're going to find between 10 and 15 
have some shades of PCOS. Ladies, are you over 40 and tired of battling that stubborn weight gain? It's time to take action and join me in my free masterclass, Conquer the Over 40 Fluff, proven strategies for a leaner, healthier you. In this game-changing free session, you are gonna get expert insights into why your metabolism has slowed and how to kickstart it again. Nutrition tips that actually work for women over 40, fun and effective workout strategies that will fit into your lifestyle no matter how busy you are, and proven strategies to help you build lasting, healthy habits. I'm Kim, and I have been there, done that, and got the smelly shaker bottles when it comes to perimenopause and menopause. And this masterclass is designed to help you break up with going hard and to make getting fit over 40 feel effortless. So if this sounds like you, don't miss your chance. Hop into this free masterclass and join me on your journey to feeling fitter and healthier. So hop over to the link in my show notes and grab your free spot. And it's rampant. And the, and the reason why it's so rampant is that it, you know, it is that we just, it has a very amorphous presentation. There's many things that can come up. Um, you know, some women look like this, some women look like that, and there's not one size fits all. Um, and, uh, and, and also, you know, patients who are now finished with their reproductive years um, may say, well, I don't know, you know, I don't have PCOS because I had three kids or I had two kids and I conceived without an issue. Um, and, and that may not be the case. And so, uh, so yeah, it's definitely very, very important. Um, you know, and, and I'm fortunate because I see patients in their, even in their teenage years, mm. all the way into their postmenopausal years. And, and, um, and I try to put little nuggets into their head in the, when, when they're younger about what they can expect later on. Yeah. And, and so, you know, talking to you about this, about these golden years, so to speak, is uh, it, it's a real big challenge, um, but it's a challenge that takes patience, energy, and positivity. Mm, absolutely. So let's just take a big step back. So I know that many people, we've heard those four letters before, right? And so you you spelled it out, poly, polycystic ovarian syndrome. What exactly is that for someone who's like, I know I've heard that that acronym before, but I have no idea what the hell it is. You know, it's funny, um, uh, even take a step further back, <laughs> it's actually polycystic means many cysts, but they don't have many cysts on their ovaries. They have many small follicles around their ovaries. Um and so people say, well, I got an ultrasound and it's not Sonotech mm. that I have a lot of cysts on my ovaries. And they all start freaking out. They do got Dr. Google. So basically, <laughs> it's, it's a, there, there's, a, there's a three-pronged approach to how patients diagnose themselves or are diagnosed with PCOS. Um, and, uh, and it's, you know, and I also believe that we are on a pendulum in life. We're not like in one box or one silo and we kind of shift in and out. Uh, so the three pronged approach of, uh, uh, that you need, uh, Rotterdam cri- criteria, whatnot, and um, basically one is irregular cycles, okay, mm-hmm. where their menstrual cycles are irregular, uh, too much bleeding, too little bleeding, no bleeding at all, um, and that as a result has a problem with ovulation, mm-hmm. and the ovulation may lead down to uh, you know trouble conceiving. Right now, I, I'm very careful to say that because if someone gets the diagnosis of PCOS. And they Google it again. It says infertility. Right. I want to make sure that that doesn't get conveyed improperly. Everyone is individual and everyone's unique and everyone's themselves. And it has to be applied to them Mm. by their healthcare practitioner. But but the infertility issue is that it's not that they're infertile and they can never have kids. Sometimes they take a little bit of a push on this side or a little push on that side. So that's the first one. It's about their menstrual cycles. Uh, the, the second one is they have something called hyperandrogenism. Now, that means that, you know, you as a woman have male hormones by definition, and then me as a man has, have female hormones, but but mine are down there and yours are up there. You know, so you have different re- ratios and I have different ratios. In a woman with PCOS, she has something called hyperandrogenism, which is elevated male hormone levels. Mm. Her testosterone is up, her DHEA is up, her androstenedione, dione, 17 OHP. Some of these things may be... Um, uh, m- maybe common to some people, may- people may not have no idea about what I'm, what I'm saying, but basically it's the male hormones. And as a result of the male hormones, this plays a, a role in that difficult ovulation spiral, whether it's right. cause or effect, it's hard to say, but what happens is that they start losing hair where they want hair growth or they have right. hair growth in their face, chest and shoulders, maybe and and stomach where they don't want hair growth. So right. it's, you know, hair issues, acne, 
Uh, they sometimes get these patchy spots on their on their backs and whatnot and, and skin manifestations. So that's the hyperandrogenism. The third thing to make the diagnosis is that what we talked about, we touched on is they get a sonogram and they see multiple small follicles on the ovary and they see that there's a, the ovaries are filled and filled and filled with eggs, but they're not letting go of that one egg once a month. Um, and so when they present and, and, you know, very, very often they'll go to two or three doctors or they'll just, they'll go misdiagnosed or undiagnosed for, for many years. Um, and, and then when they show up and they're like, yeah, I, you know, this is what's happened and this is how it's been developed. So PCOS is, is the take home message is the most common endocrine disorder for women. Mm -hmm. Um, it, and it should never be overlooked. And I, I get, I get a few a few problems I get with my patients is they come to me and they say, well, my doctor says I definitely don't have it now, or I definitely do have it, or I definitely am infertile. And I, I, it pains me. Right. To, with to, that to definite word. Extent, it, that word. Exactly. When you come in here and you have that, you know, you come in here, uh, patients are very, um, are very sensitive and I'll, I'll share yes. a story with you later on about that, but you have to be so careful with what you say. If you're, if you're a healthcare practitioner, right. if you're a doctor, you have to be so careful. So when you start saying those words like definite, this definite, that I'm like, take a step back. Let's let's talk about facts. Right. Let's talk about what you're doing. Because let's talk I about take what you're it. trying to accomplish. Yeah. I take it and yeah. it's like it's the gospel. Like you my doctor yeah. told me X and it is the gospel. And if you're someone like me, a questioner, you know, you might get that second opinion. Or you might go home and you're like, I'm destined to never be a mother, or I'm destined to whatever they told you it is that your definite diagnosis was. Yeah. It's really painful. And so a lot of the stuff I do in my office is un I uh, walk them off the cliff, walk them back, yes. trying to get back to, you know, why did that doctor say that? Well, maybe he or she was saying this because of this. Maybe he or she was saying this because of this. And and you kind of have to like really guide them into like, oh, this is the understanding. Oh, these are the things that I can do to make a, ch a, a positive a change. Because once you give them that diagnosis or you say that you're, you have, you know, you're trending towards or then these are the things that can guide you out of it. Right. And once you you educate them and yes. empower them, yes. and I think that's a lot of what you're doing on your show is you're actually education and you're empowering. And I think that that's wonderful. And that's why I wanted to come on the show, because I, I felt like, like I said to you earlier, there's, there's great energy, there's great education. I know that, you you know, you have your followers and your your clients. And I think that that's really what you have to emphasize, that you know, sometimes you take a step back, sometimes, you know, like last week like I, I also i'm i'm trying to exercise more i'm trying to lose weight and i'm i'm in my 50s and if i don't eat well for a week i you know my my scale goes up and i'm like right. darn it I, I worked for three months to move it down like this and then all of a sudden i had a bad week and it goes up and you know what i biked this morning you know 30k uh and and you just gotta get out there and do it because because every day i, I always say is like is, is a part of in, in the war it's like a battle and you gotta eat yes. right and you exercise and you got to try to save the day. And the end of the week, you try to have more wins and losses. So it's uh, it's 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 you know it's exciting to 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 be part of this. Absolutely. So now, like you know, as you as you mentioned, so I'm what if I'm that seventy percent of the women out there? And because everything you just described is as far as PCO minus the um, getting the cast scan. But I think about like. I know in my 20s, there are plenty of times I had irregular periods. There are plenty of times that some of us are like, well, I'm just, you know, my oh, my whole family has, is hairy. You know, you just kind right. of like there are little things that you kind of dismiss because, yeah, you're like, I'm stressed out or I'm this or I'm that. And you just kind of start to discount that. Are there, you know, as people start to think about what you just said, you're like, oh, could I potentially have PCOS or could, like you say, trending towards that yeah that's a great question and i, I want to kind of like level set what a normal menstrual cycle is or what a normal year of of reproductive health is it, there's so many things that have to happen when someone's not on the pill when someone that have to have the brain mm -hmm. tells the ovaries to tell the uterus to tell to, to, you know da, 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 and there's about a million things if i drew you this the 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 cascade that has to happen for an effective menstrual cycle for an effective ovulation that would either induce a pregnancy or lead to a pregnancy or lead to a menstruation it you're like oh my god how does anyone ever ovulate how does anyone ever get pregnant and it's, it's it's a miracle and it is funny because like i mean if you think about like what we, us lay people are taught what an eighth grade health class is that basically the first time you ever have sex you're going to have a baby like that is <laughs> that is how it is explained to us like it right, is like right. the, like every single time you have unprotected sex 
you are going to have a baby. And meanwhile, right, right. Everyone who here is listening who's tried to that method, they're like, it ain't happened to me. I had sex a hundred times and right. I still so, needed some help. <laughs> so so when a patient comes to me and she says she has irregular bleeding, I kind of get a little bit of the history. I find out, you know, her stress levels because the brain also talks, mm. you know, one part of the brain talks to another part of the brain talks to the thyroid, talks to the adrenals. So then you're talking about stress, and then the stress has then it has positive feedback or negative feedback. And so and, and during the month, the first part of the cycle is estrogen dominant. And then it's then there's something called the LH spike and the LH surge uh, causes the ovulation. And so it's such an intricate, um, detailed and delicate yeah. uh, flow that uh, I'm sorry about the word flow, but uh, give and take that that any one thing that goes off, somebody traveled, someone had a, a stress in her life that it, it's not uncommon. And actually, it's very common for a woman not on birth control or anything like that to miss one or two periods a year yeah. or have irregular bleeding. That is normal. doesn't mean that she's got PCOS. Right. So now, but when she starts saying, well, you know, then you start getting the history and say, well, you know, we have been trying, I haven't been su successful. I get my period every two to three months and it's like a longer period. Then you start sh scratching your head and then you start saying, hey, this may be she's not ovulating. This may be that she's having difficulty. This may be that, you know, and then you start doing some blood work and whatnot, but not every missed period it means that she has PCOS. Gotcha. And and also, I believe that, as I, I mentioned, we live on a pendulum. Mm. And if you're doing the right stuff on the right diets and the right exercises and the right nutrition and doing the right stuff, um, I think that you can move that pendulum away from the edge, right? Right, into, right. Into, into the non-PCOS. But if you're a, a PCOS trending person and you kind of go, then you're over on the edge and you're over the edge and then all of a sudden you're not having the the cyclicity that you're looking for um, right. so sometimes you don't need to go all the way to the to the far end to cure yourself you just need to kind of drift over a little bit and and i think that there's a lot to be said for like making minor changes um and doing things the right way so so it's a big picture and i also I try to identify with the patients and what they want now one of the biggest problems in the pco diagnosis is when a patient walks into the office, the doctor who now, as you're well aware, has less and less and less time to actually talk to the patient. Yes. So, so the doctor walks in, and the patient walks in, and the doctor like knows within a few minutes that this patient has PCOS. It says, "We'll check your bloods, we'll check your labs, we'll check your your ultrasound. Do you want to get pregnant? No. Here's birth control pills. Do you want to get pregnant? Yes. Here's infertility." And then I'm like. Oh my God, you know, like that's so bad because they're not talking to the patient or, or even worse. You want to hear the worst thing they say to them? You ready? What? I think you're going to know this. Oh, just lose weight and you'll be okay. Oh, and that yeah. is as damaging as it gets. Yeah. Um, lose weight or and, uh, stop eating. Like My doctor told me to stop eating sandwiches. Oh, smart. That's a brilliant thing to say. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, cool I, mountain I, water. <laughs> yeah, I had to sit on my hands. I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to jail today. Like, I was just so, yeah. like, pissed. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that, those are not helpful because I think that, that you know, we as a society want a quick fix, quick fix, quick yes. fix. Yes. But, but, you know, it didn't happen overnight. It's not going to get better overnight. And Say so, that again. Say that again. What? Said, what, 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 what said, yeah. It didn't happen overnight. It's not going to get better overnight. Ladies, did you hear that? Like, like I want you just to take that snippet and like put it on some type of audio device and just repeat it every single time you want something to happen overnight. Nothing happens yeah. overnight except for like sunlight yeah. and moonlight. That's the only thing that happens overnight. <laughs> yeah. So it's a uh, I, I get that a lot. And I try to reemphasize that. And then, like I said, those baby steps, like just trying to make good habits and trying to put things that are together and do things that you like. Mm. You know, I actually I have a whole you know presentation I give to my patients who are actually in the PCOS world. I go through the diagnosis that we just went through. What well, actually the present presenting symptoms that the patient sitting in front of me has. And like we go through this different symptoms. Then we go through the diagnosis. And then I go through different causes of PCOS, and there's three slash four different types of PCOS, but not everyone has one. Everyone could have multiples, right? And so, and then I go through what you actually can do that you can actually do. And I go through the nutrition and the diet and the exercise and the mental wellness and the microbiome and the, and the supplements. And then eventually the end of the circle, the end of my seventh pillar, I, I call it, is, is medication because sometimes they will need medication. And ultimately, they may need a birth control or they may need infertility work. But there's so much to do to get up to that, that anything you do. And, and if you if you make ownership of any of those circles as you go through the pillars, you actually everything you do from then on is going to be more effective. 
Right. And so it's really, uh, and, and, you know, and it's something that particularly pertains to your patient population is PCOS does set patients up for downstream complications of life. Okay. Mm. And they need to know about it early. And I tell them about it early and I tell them about it, you know, uh, and I ask them about it, you know, as they come to me and they're having the irregular periods later on in life um, that, you know, maybe she did have shades of PCOS. Mm. Maybe she did, you know, but, you know, so, so they're at risk for heart disease. They're at risk for metabolic syndrome, prediabetes, type two diabetes. Um, uh, it, it, you know, there are some other issues that are some different types of cancers, like endometrial cancer they're at risk for. Uh, so it, it's, it's, you can't just look, you know, with your blinders on and say, Hey, right. you came to me because you want to get pregnant and you have PCOS. No, you have to say, hey, if you have PCOS, you have to do some real lifestyle changes that, that, that will affect you because you don't, you'll get pregnant. You'll have a kid. You want to take care of that kid and, and, and for the rest of, you know, a long life and enjoy, enjoy it, you know, and, and dance at her wedding or his wedding and, and, you know, walking down the aisle <laughs> healthy. Right. Um, so let's take a step back. I really liked what you said because I don't, I think most people, and you probably see this in your practice, they want you to give them like, here's the magic pill, right? This, here's the magic right. pill to, and everything's going to go away. But yeah, I loved how you said there's like, there's an, a pillar approach that you're looking at it. Okay. We're going to start here and see how that works. And then if that doesn't work, right. we go from another place to another place to another place. And for those of you guys listening, like, this is what you want from a doctor, right? You want them to have like, no, like, okay, everyone's different. You're like, I can have, like he said, that pendulum, I could be like knocking on the teetering edge of PCOS, or I could be just like at the beginning of my PCOS journey. And he's going to treat me differently. And I'm going to do different tweaks to get me to get into that more center part of that pendulum. And I really like that um, approach. And I want you to think about that when you're talking to your doctor or you're trying to get to this diagnosis, that it's not going to be this like magic pill and you're sent out on your way. Yeah. You know, I, I think it is a great point you're making. And I think that that's a mentality that, so, so it's not just the doctors are not talking to patients or educating their patients anymore. Patients are very demanding and they yes. want one pill to fix everything. And I think there's, there's a give and take for both of them that not only do doctors need to talk, uh, more to their patients and be more, um, uh, edu- you know, bring on the education more and be more of a partner uh, mm-hmm. with them. But also the, the patients need to step up also and say, hey, I'm going to I'm going to change some of my lifestyle and my uh, more of a holistic approach and maybe get some more medication to help. But but I'm not looking for that medication, that, that one, you know, that one shot um, that can reverse everything. Uh, and I think that that's uh, that's a partnership, really. And and that partnership is is, you know, I'm going to do the, the medical side. You're going to do your side and, and we're going to bounce it. You know, I may be wrong. I may need to, need to adapt it here or there. I may put you on the wrong pill. I may need to change it. But as long as we're, we have open communication, um, we're going to get through this together. And the data shows it, that it works. You know, that approach yeah. really works. And it's, I'm I'm fortunate that I do have a partnership with my doctor because I ask a lot of questions. And, you know, but the best thing I always can uh, give advice to people going into a doctor in this situation, write your questions down. Like, just write them all down. Cause so many times I know that like, you'll say something to me and it doesn't really sink in, but I know that I, this is what I've been thinking about, what I've been questioning. And if I write it down before I go in, I don't like, I don't blank. Like physically I come in with a piece of paper, if you need to put it on your notes app, whatever, so that you can ask the questions and not feel like, and if you feel dismissed right. by your doctor, it's time to get a new doctor. Get a, get a new doctor. Yeah. I, um, I, I can't, I, I tell it, well, I have a, you know, a, a fairly large pregnant population as well. And I tell them, I'm going to see you in four to six weeks from now, please just write it during the month. If it's not urgent and your questions, um, please write them down and come in with your list. It's critical because the second they walk out, like when you're in front of that doctor, that's your time. You yeah. have my undivided attention. I have all your labs in front of me. I have everything. And you have my undivided attention. I will answer all your questions. Um, you know, it, that can burn you a few times because there are patients out there that can, uh, right. you know, that, Hang that, on. You to, <laughs> <laughs> that you have to be able to, uh, to get some balance in, but, but yeah, it's definitely a, uh, it, it's your time, like I said, and, and that's what I'm there to do because the bottom line is a better educated patient yes. about the, the, the process. And I don't want to say disease process by, by about the medical aspects of that, of their life. 
and how it applies to them because a lot of them come in with their friend said this and their mm. friend said that and their friend like that pill and their friend like that and I hate that pill and I, I I don't care about everybody else. Right. You know, if you're that one of a thousand sitting in front of me, I only care about you. So yeah, so yes, knowledge is good, but we have to you know adapt it and, and train it for you. And so an educated patient is a much more compliant patient. If she yes. understands that every time she does that exercise regimen, this is what it's doing in my body right. specifically, then yeah, then I'm going to, I'm going to win. And that patient's going to be more compliant. And that's not even news. That's, that's published data. Um, and also having more touch points with your doctor and being in touch with them. Uh, but, uh, but, but the compliance is a huge issue because, you know, you get into these excellent exercise regimens and you download this app and go into this place and you do it for two, three, four, five weeks, you know, it's just, it, it wears off. Right. Um, and so you have to find something that you like and keep with it. So you you mentioned that for people who you know might already have this diagnosis, the, that there's some lifestyle changes that need to happen if you are uh, do have uh, PCOS. What are some of those lifestyle changes that uh, need to happen? Okay, great. Um, so just to, uh, I'll take it one step back. When when we make the diagnosis that there's three different three to four different types of, of PCOS, and again, they, there's a lot of overlap between the two. Mm -hmm. Predominantly, the number one cause of PCOS, and up to eighty percent, is something called insulin resistance, which you yep. may have heard about, which you mm -hmm. may have spoken about. We could spend weeks and weeks and weeks and only and only scratch the surface of insulin resistance. Yep. Um, and uh, you know, you may be familiar with insulin resistance as it it overlaps with um, type. Two diabetes, right. okay, and there is a lot of overlap with someone with PCOS with type two diabetes and metabolic syndrome later on in life, um, and that's something that you know she just say ah you know that's important need to know about that, um, and then there's one the next and, and the next one is called uh, uh, adrenal uh, adrenal uh, PCOS where their their stress hormones are very high it's like glucocorticoids that you know because we all have stress hormones in our and if we have a lot of high level of stress that actually can it, it, it have a negative impact on the ovarian production of hormones and, and put you into a PCOS scenario. So that's the second one, again, about five to 15, you know, five to 15 percent. And then the third uh, one is inflammatory, where you have a lot of pro-inflammatory markers in your body. Your C-reactive proteins are high and you have a, a unhealthy gut microbiome and, and that's like spewing off a lot of pro-inflammation um, and leaky gut syndrome and 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 all the inflammation kind of is circulating, and mm -hmm. it actually goes to the goes to the ovary, and it makes it more difficult to ovulate, and the the surface of the ovary becomes inflamed, um, and so if they don't ovulate, they get that whole cascade again. Um, so 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 then I say, okay, let's let's assume you're in the in the insulin resistance, or you may you know you could be adrenal, and you something you know, Tuesday you could be the adrenal, Wednesday you could be the <laughs> the inflammatory, and Thursday you could be the the insulin resistance. So it really doesn't matter to me because I. I go down into, into my Venn diagram and I say PCOS at the middle. What can I do as a patient that can reverse that? And, and so I start in the first circle. I, I write diet. I go every week. I And I'm telling you, I'm sitting in my office now. I have piles and piles of, new, of papers that I read that I get into my inbox about this diet working and this yes, diet working and that yes, diet working. Yes. I'm, sure, I'm sure you see I'm sure you see it in, in, yeah. in the alerts and stuff. And, it, you know, that stuff is great, but it drives me crazy. Because patients, I, I hate that diet culture. If I do mm. this diet, it 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 like it'll cure me of this, that, and the other. Right, and it's going to save me from myself. Yeah, and I really find I, I love that people are working on it and 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 acknowledging it. But again, they have to get to the to the core of why. What's the underlying cause that you're actually trying to reverse? That then you're going to make the right choices in your diet. Um, so I've seen. You know, and again, the diet has to work for you. Yes. If, you're, if it's too expensive, if it's too arduous, if you are, you know, a double job working mom, et cetera, et cetera, you're not going to be able to prepare. You're just going to go to McDonald's. It's just not going to work. We have to figure out something else out for you. So um, as diets go, I've seen, you know, no, you know, keto, uh, slow keto, 30, 30, 30, um, uh, intermittent fasting. Yeah. Uh, um carnivore that 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 was big for a little bit but the one that i'm most favorite of because it's got the most beautiful foods is the mediterranean diet yep. it actually has it has the the it has a lot of a lot of great data if you just go into like pubmed and do you know mediterranean diet and, and and pcos you'll see amazing data on it um but if you look at any of these studies you have to be very careful look at the 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 sample size 
and also look at the length of, of intervention. Okay. Cause these patients yeah. are on it for a long time, like maybe 12 weeks before they start seeing an effect, but the diet is just one aspect of eating. I think the relationship with food is, is yes. really important. Yes. Um, so that's my next. So, so I don't tell a patient to take this diet or that diet. I kind of say that the, the core, the core, you know, um, tenets of that, the, that box are finding a diet that works for you that has the right, you know, scientific validity, basically decreasing your carbs and decreasing your, you know, the oil, the, the unhealthy oils, increasing your proteins, um, you know, big, big picture type of thing. I'm not going to write her a, a diet for her while she's in my office in 15 minutes. I think she's got to like learn about it, understand what she likes, you right. know, uh, how it's good for her family. The next circle is nutrition. Now you're going to ask me, Herman, what, what, what's the difference between nutrition and diet? And I go, well, diet is what you eat. Nutrition is how you eat, where you eat, when you eat, why mm. you eat. Mm. Okay. You know, that Saturday, that the Friday night friend who calls you and out for drinks and a pizza. Yep. Uh, and and it's uh, only, go- it's only going to be one drink and, you know, right, maybe right, a split right. an appetizer and then the menu. And comes. I, I, I don't want you to to abandon that friend. I think those are great friends to have, and I think that's very important to to you know for your mental wellness. But you know maybe have a smoothie or something. Maybe have some something else that's not, or fill up before you go. But just that the eating late, eating you know drinking alcohol not at the right times and whatnot. You know I don't want you to sp- uh, live a Spartan life, but just think about the timing. Eating late at night is also not healthy. Uh, it's been proven that if your glucose spikes at after eight o'clock, you have like you know, 10%, all your uh, effective, like if you take someone does the same exact thing in diet and exercise, but her, her glucose spike is before eight o'clock, right? Then she has like a, a 5% improved weight loss than the person who has those glucose spikes later on at night. So it's the timing of your meals as well. Um, and, you know, when I talk about the, the relationship with food, you know, you don't have to finish the plate. You don't have to eat until you can't eat anything else. You don't have to, you know, like all these things that, you know, my mom used to train me, you know, we've got to finish everything on your plate, you know? Yes. And, and, and so like, we're starting to learn that those things are. Right. You know, Cause there was always that, some that, starving person in some other country. Somewhere. You're wasting, like, you were just going to throw it out anyway. What is, you know, so right. it'll, it'll sit with me forever. Um, so that's important. Um, the next thing is going to be a little bit interesting um, that you may or may not know about. It's something called food order. Mm. Um, are you are you familiar with food order? You know, it's funny. Um, are you familiar with a woman? Oh, she does. She wrote a book, Glucose Goddess. Oh, I I think I've heard about that. Yeah. yeah so she was one of the first people that I like that I heard about that whole order of food, and so it was one of those things where you're kind of like, is this kind of pseudoscience? And so you kind of like dive into the rabbit hole <laughs> yeah it's not pseudoscience it's, no it, it really makes a difference it makes a difference if you and I'll, I'll tell you like if you ever go out for sushi and you eat the sushi i'm, I'm always hungry an hour later oh yeah right because when you eat the rice first so let's just say you have a, a plate of rice broccoli avocado and uh chicken breast healthy 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 protein healthy carb healthy fiber healthy fats right and you eat the rice first, that spikes your insulin. Your right. insulin spikes because your insulin sees that big carb load and says, hey, I have to deal with this. Then you eat everything else, and then it'll, it'll drop your, your, your sugars precipitously because your insulin was so high. It won't, it's not, you're not in any danger because you're not a diabetic, but, right. but it drops it, and an hour later, you're hungry again, and you're craving again. So one of the number one symptoms of, of, uh, of PCOS is craving. And that's mm. why they're just not eating properly. So, so it's, it's, you have to pre- prevent that insulin spike. Um, and so you want to eat the complex carbs. You want to eat the fiber. You want to eat the, so you get that very muted insulin elevation. If you get that muted in, il, insulin elevation, you could get a muted glucose curve and it's going to carry you longer. And the more proteins you eat, it's going to carry you longer in terms of your satiety. So you're not going to have to like, you know, binge and do a, I, I say foraging, you know, I stand oh, yeah. in front of my pa- mm-hmm. pantry and I forage, you know, like in the forest. <laughs> right. It, it, you know, I always, one of the big things I always tell my clients is that a lot of people find they end up foraging because they denied themselves something. So like, oh, I'm not going to have whatever it is, your, you know, the pizza or the whatever it is your thing is. And I'm always like, have that piece of pizza or that slice of cake because 
in your mind, you are you're keep looking for that cake or the pizza, whatever. And so you're in that cupboard chasing that taste. Right. And eating and eating at midnight or 10 o'clock is much, much worse than having that pizza at seven. It right. really is. I mean, I'm not again. Don't say, well, Dr. Wasted to have pizza at seven. That's okay. I'm 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 saying let's let's, you know, let's just think right. about we, what the downstream effects you know, are. We all yeah. have, we don't we all don't crave pizza every day. But you know, that time right. that like if you're sitting down with your family and they're having pizza, have that slice of pizza versus like, I'll just have my kale salad while you guys have your pizza. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. It's it's painful. It is that when everyone else is, is around you doing and that's what that relationship with food and friends and whatnot. But um one of the other thing what was the other thing oh so the next thing i talk about is exercise and and you know and again i love the internet i hate the internet i love social i hate social it's like sometimes those people out there that could be mm, so toxic yes toxicity the, don't do this never do this always do this oh my god yeah. like you you just go i can't do anything you know and they're, so it, they're so convincing because like in your mind you're like oh my god like i've been doing it all wrong for all these years all wrong <laughs> exactly so like, I, I try to like i try to see the patient sitting in front of me and say listen i know you're you know i know you got to get one kid to kindergarten another kid you got to do here and they got to pick up over here and soccer with this and moms and I go, you, do, you have to work something into your schedule that you like to do so yes. you do it, okay? Yes. Now, now we, one of the things I have not gotten off of, but like CrossFit. Now, mm -hmm. there are people that are addicted to CrossFit. And let me tell you, CrossFit is actually, it's pro-inflammation. It, it gets a lot of inflammation in the body. Yeah. And that's part of like, wow, if you're going to cause all that inflammation, it's going to have the negative effect on the PCOS. And I go, da, 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 da. And the bottom line is that if you're addicted to an exercise, do it. <laughs> right. Do it. I don't want to change that. Um, maybe you can alter some of the, the high impact stuff. So you're not causing so much inflammation, but definitely do it. There's a, a great camaraderie there. There's a great uh, uplifting. So there were times where I was saying, you know, don't do CrossFit, just do so and so. But I'm like, I'm off that. I'm like, if you like it and you're addicted to it, that's the best thing that can happen to you. Yeah. And um, yoga, whatever it is, it's, it's something that's really, really important. And you're right, because I feel like people in my field will be like, you shouldn't go to F45 and CrossFit and Orange Theory. It's yeah. the devil. And then I'm like, but if I like that stuff and it's going to get right. me to go, then great. Now, instead of telling me not to do it, how do I sprinkle it in? So instead of going to CrossFit right. seven days a week, maybe say, like, hey, you know, can we scale it back? Maybe we go to five days a week. Can we go to four days right. a week? So we give our and body some something else. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But it's like we are just more about like the nose than the like, how do we find a balance? Yes. Yes. I think that's the critical. The critical key there is the balance because uh, the nose are it, it's it's so painful to hear that advice because it's so bad to say don't do something when like it's actually good for them um, right. so what i tell my patients i say three to four days a week of you know 45 minutes to an hour of getting that heart rate up there doing some you know cardio try to find something like what walking running biking uh cycling you know even you know pilates i'm a big fan of pilates i'm a big fan of because of the core strengthening yeah uh, and the pelvic and the pelvic floor because pelvic after floor for sure yes um as as women age and go through the estrogen you know drops um it becomes an, a real issue and i try mm. to tell my patients all the time uh and also the patients that they're they're trying to get pregnant i say the best thing you do is be healthy before pregnancy yep you know stay, stay healthy during pregnancy because labor is is challenging um and then we want you to bounce back as fast as possible you know in, in post-pregnancy so it's really important to to, to, to have that frame of mind. And then the next thing I talk about in exercise in that circle of exercise is uh, post in the hour after you eat, doing some sort of 15 to 20 minutes of, of exercise. And I don't mean anything strenuous. I mean, not going back to your computer and just typing on, da, 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 you know, typing on the computer, not, not just sitting down at the office and doing something. I'm talking about doing just body weight squats at your at your desk yeah i have in i have in my um um my bag uh where is it uh, resistance bands now i could do a full a full body workout in 15 yeah. minutes all the muscle groups uh if a patient doesn't show up and i have 15 minutes i'm able to do a full exercise you know just so the reason why it's so important and, and sometimes it's just walking around your house walking yep. around your block walking around your building 
um, doing a couple flights of stairs in the hour after you eat. Because think back to what the, what I said earlier about the insulin spike. Yeah. When that insulin spikes after you eat, it does choose one of two things. Okay, it will take and it, it, you know insulin is um, a protective enzyme or it's protective a uh, hormone. It says. Uh, I want to save this energy, which is what you're eating. Goes, it's broken down to glucose. That's why when you eat something, it's broken down to glucose. The more complex it is, the harder and more energy you use to break it down, the the better balance you have. Okay, like that whole glycemic index which mm-hmm. we didn't talk about during the diet, and you know, but the but that was a very important topic that we probably could spend another hour on. Um, For sure. But uh, but when the insulin sees that glucose, it says, "I'm going to store this." For the famine so yeah. when the famine comes i'm going to protect my my right. body and the and famine never comes liver, <laughs> right it never comes i can go get a piece of pizza right now or i can go get a you know uh a shawarma or whatever and just and just eat my arse like whatever and however i want so there's no famine i mean whatever <laughs> we'll talk about politics another time but um <laughs> but the uh the the um the fact is is that it takes it and says i'm going to store it in the liver and i'm going to store it in the fat OK, because then that's that's it's stable there and I'll get it later. What the body, what the insulin wants to do is store it in your skeletal muscles. OK, yeah. because if you exercise, you you need you need to you're using energy to exercise and the body will say, hey, I need to re- replenish that. And so the body goes and says the, the insulin says, oh, I'm going to put it to my skeletal muscles. Okay, and store it for the next time you're going to need it, and it's not going to go to your liver, and it's not going to go to your to your fat deposits. So it's it's you know, and then again, our what did our mothers always tell us? Don't exercise after you eat. Don't swim right. after you eat. Because you cramp don't, don't, or don't. whatever. <laughs> I'm not telling you to go swimming. I'm telling you to do some sort of ten to fifteen minutes in the hour after you eat. Critical. Yeah. That alone, that alone uh, can make all the difference in the world. Um, and so. Just to continue, and you know, stop me if you have any questions on it. Yep. But just to continue to the next, to the next circle is, is mental wellness. Yeah. Um, the next circle is mental wellness, um, and you know, it should be the first circle. But I, I talk about mental wellness because it kind of ties into a few other things. Um, and I also I don't talk about mental illness because mental illness obviously is something that needs to be really addressed, uh, identified, healthcare practitioner, you know, social worker. Everyone needs to chip in on that because it's a it's a critical you know thing that needs to needs its uh support and again another whole entire uh podcast yeah, mental on, health yeah uh, for as sure well. but as as it goes in terms of uh mental wellness is i want you, tr- you i want you to try to maintain a mental mental wellness what does that mean uh get enough sleep yes and it's been very well proven that seven to eight hours uh, who can get seven to eight hours of sleep a night you know uh of good sleep. And that means no phones in an hour to two hours before you sleep, no phones right when you wake up, um, because that, that is shown to decrease your REM and, and you need, you're not getting that effective, uh, uh, you know, you're still active in your brain, even though you're sleeping and you're not getting restful sleep. Um, because one of the things about PCOS is, is they're always fatigued. They don't have any energy. Um, and they don't have, they have very fitful nights and insomnia. Um, and so, and so what I try to do is I try to make sure that they're getting good sleep habits and sleep hygiene. Yeah. Um, so that's that's another thing. Um, also, do you know the number one um, antidepressant in the world? You have it, I have it, no matter where we live, we had it. We've talked about it earlier. Um, no. Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> it's, it's the sun. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, the, the sun. The early Vitamin morning D. sun. Yeah, even and it, I mean, if if your early morning sun is is preferable, but any sun, um, activating the vitamin D, activating the mel- melatonin, and and uh, you know dopamine. So what I try to do is I try to do two of those circles together and say, hey, if you're able to do that exercise outside, that's even better. You know, get that yeah. outdoor. You know, breathe it in, um, and you know that alone could act. You know, really activate the the receptors decrease your stress levels mm. okay inc- improving your, and then so now remember what we talked about the um the adrenal type of pcos now if you decrease your stress you're decreasing that type of pcos so, so you're kind of doing things that are multifaceted and multiple pronged approach so so that's mental wellness um so it's like diet nutrition exercise mental wellness 
uh, microbiome. The microbiome um, is is we're covered with bacteria, uh, and and the bacteria are both good and bad. Mostly good. They're protective. Um, they actually help break down some of some of our food that we ingest, uh, that we can metabolize it better. Um, but sometimes after, if you have an unhealthy diet, if you have more antibiotics than you need, if you have, you know, b- downstream effects is that sometimes the microbiome shifts. It's, you yeah. know, tens of millions of different types of bacteria into an unhealthy microbiome. I mean, I'm sure you've, you've read about it. You've seen papers on a healthy microbiome versus an unhealthy microbiome. Right. And, um, and, uh, and so there are certain types of microbiome you know, uh, uh, or ecosystems that are actually associated with different diseases, such as cancer, neurodegenerative disorders, um, Alzheimer's, uh, autoimmune disorders, mm. diabetes, metabolic syndrome, pre- pre-diabetes, and believe it or not, PCOS. Right. Because of that whole inflammatory insulin resistance yeah. pathway. Um, it's not like you could just snap your fingers and change your microbiome, but what you can do is that you can institute taking probiotics, prebiotics, um, symbiotics, uh, improving your diet with, with sauerkrauts and cabbage salads and more of the, of the, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? Vinegar, um, acetic acid. Um, what am I, what, 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 what's it called? Uh, I, I can see it in my head, not red wine vinegar. Oh, um, uh, apple cider vinegar. Apple cider vinegar, yeah. I'm like, look at the bottom of my in my picture of my head. I couldn't remember apple cider vinegar, and I take shots of it all the time. Um, and so some of these things can actually improve your um, improve your microbiome. Uh, and then you know, unfortunately, sometimes we go to antibiotics, and they just wipes our antibiotic, you know, wipes out the good bacteria again. And you've got to battle back. So try to you know, don't just go to the doctor and get antibiotics for what you think is a strep throat. Make the diagnosis of the strep throat. Make yeah. sure you're not just calling it in. And unfortunately. With our telemedicine, which is both helpful and harmful, um, I, I feel like we're we're doing a lot of um, a lot of unnecessary antibiotics, in, in, and that's yeah. doing damage in in a long stream. It's it's really easy to call in and get a Z pack, and you're just like, do you need one, or do you just need to get right. your ass to bed? Like, what? what? Right. What? Yeah. yeah, yeah, and you know, again, I think that one of the uh, one of our problems also is. We're in a very litigious world, and if you don't get antibiotics, yes. you need it that, that one out of right. ten times. So the doctor is like, "Take the antibiotics and call me, you know, call me later." But right. but again, so so try try to try to do things, learn about your microbiome, improve your microbiome. The next thing I I I tell my patients is again the same thing. You know, as a doctor, I keep getting papers in my inbox and every every magazine, uh, every uh, research article, uh, journal. Um, they talk about these host of supplements that have worked to reverse PCOS. Mm. Um, and the way that those are working is that they make your insulin more more sensitive. Like you don't have to have your insulin levels here to get your glucose levels down into the normal levels. You can have your insulin levels here because they're working harder and better. And, and so I started looking at this from a very uh, holistic perspective and saying, why am I not telling my patients to take these, these supplements? Um, I don't want to err too much on that side because sometimes when doctors start going that way, they start like losing the dialogue and narrative and start becoming like this. I don't want to say a quack, but like right. you know, they, they start, they stop losing the, 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 the medical narrative. And so, and so I, I go through it with them and say why they work, what we're trying to accomplish, what you have to do to be a partner in this is decrease your sugar intake, decrease this, decrease that, and try to like, and say, and this, this is why it's going to help. Um, so after about a few years in my career, I, I started getting a whole bunch of, of, you know, ideas, take this supplement, take that supplement, take that supplement. And one time a, a, a patient's father texted me a picture of like seven supplements that right. I had recommended to his daughter. And, and I'm like, Oh my God, look at that. It must cost you $400 for that. Mm-hmm. And he's like, yeah, it was 300, 384. And each one of them has data that supports usage in PCOS and metabolic syndrome. And I said, well, that's when I, the, the Eureka moment, I said, why don't I put this all together? Why don't I manufacture my own? I'll sell it to my patients. I'll go on, on, you know, I'll open up a, a site and I, each one of them has reasons. So I actually did. Oh. I did. And I started, I did, I started selling a, uh, uh, a, a supplement that has 11 different ingredients, all tagged 
for PCOS and t- type type two diabetes because we do know that metformin, which is a medication right. for for type two diabetes, works in PCOS because it makes their uh, insulin more sensitive, dropping insulin levels, dropping LH levels, and then they ovulate. I mean, I'm I'm not dumbing it down. I'm kind of like cutting to the chase of right, right. what happens. So I started putting my patients on my supplement. Right. I am telling you, I had a, I had a patient who had who had chin hair. When she's on it, her chin hair resolved within two to three weeks. Her and acne who improved. Right. <laughs> who's like, I want the chin hair. Yeah. And, and and then when like and when she couldn't get it because it was out of stock in one store, she she it grew back and, and that quickly. And I was like, this is not supposed to wow. work that quickly. Like, well, it, it's actually working very quickly. Um. And so and so that's the uh, that was the, and again, I, you could look at the at, at the contents. Um on my site, on each one, and say, hey, that makes sense, that makes sense, that makes sense, because it each attacks this insulin resistance at, at a different aspect. And then there's right. some anti-inflammatories, the coenzyme Qs and the berberines, uh, red yeast. Um, and so it attacks each type of different, um, you know, type uh, of uh, PCOS. And then the last circle, the seventh circle, is medication. Yeah. Because if you go on birth control pill, if you go on infertility medication, both of those will work better, I guarantee, if you're doing all of the other pillars. Um, right. And 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 it's and it's like baby steps. Um, mm-hmm. The way that I end my discussion with this patients, and I try to do this in a rather quick manner. Um, I, I you're familiar with uh, James Clear Atomic Habits. Yeah, he's my Bible. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's it's so incredible. It really is. Everyone should read it. Um, I'm. It, it's. It's mind blowing. So I, I. I draw them. I don't know if you remember in the introduction. There's a chart, right? The chart is, and this is this resonates. I say, people think. People think that that on the you know the x-axis is time and on the y-axis is effort. If I put this time in, and I do this effort, I will hit my goal right here. And they think it's linear. Yes. Right. They think it's linear. And and then after two weeks, after three weeks, they get discouraged and they they're not making any any progress towards that goal. And so like 70, 80, 90 percent of people will fall off. I call that the valley of tears, the valley of despair, yeah, the valley exactly. of, 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 of failure. They think they're not getting anywhere. And they all fall off and they're back right where they started, even worse off where they started because they feel that they can't accomplish anything in their their, you know, their depression or whatever, their self-worth and their. Yeah, and it's 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 so difficult. So I always tell my patients, don't make a goal of whether it be weight loss, a number on a scale. I, I want the habits to become indoctrinated into yes. yourself and and define who you are, so that when you actually keep doing them, keep doing them, you, you'll be like, oh my god, I not only did I hit my goal, I passed my goal, and now it's the next goal, um, right. onwards and upwards. And and so you know, I always give the example of this one couple that I see. Like, and every, every evening they're out, you know, they're out. I know they went away and they come back and they're, they're, they're out there again. They're just doing their laughs on the, in our block. And right. it's, it's incredible. You always see them out there and it defines who they are. And so one day I, 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 I bumped into him on the street and I said, you know, I, I talk about you, not you personally, but I talk about your mentality in, in, to my patients about how that, def- I think of you, I think of you as an exercise that does such and such. And so it defines him. He goes, well, yeah, I got hurt. I haven't exercised like in six months. I'm like, really? <laughs> and so, right. and so, he, so I actually spurned him to go back out there. And uh, he says, I'm going to go back out there now. And and sure enough, he went back out there. I hadn't even noticed because for years I had seen him out there. I didn't realize he was hurt because I hadn't seen him out there for six. I just assumed he was going at a different time. So I thought that was pretty funny. So before we wrap up, I wanted to ask like one last question here was that, you know, you you talked about that PCOS might cause maybe more symptoms for women downstream if I have not been diagnosed. So what are some of the symptoms that I might be experiencing, you know, more than a normal uh, non-PCOS uh, person? Right. So so first and foremost, um, the, the not to say the vast majority, but the majority of patients with PCOS struggle with weight their whole life. Okay. And it's just, it's, it's, it's a battle. Um, and it, you know, they eat and their friend who doesn't have PCOS or 
uh, eats the same thing and she loses weight and she gains weight. And it's, it's, it's very frustrating, very struggling. So they actually have a higher risks of depression, anxiety and, and mood disorders. Okay. That's documented. Um, they have a higher risk of developing type two diabetes, uh, then metabolic syndrome, cardiovascular health is at risk, uh, different types of dementia as well. Mm. Um, so, I mean, these things should really make, make a big difference if, if people are, you know, people sometimes don't think that far in advance. No. Um, but I always tell, I always talk to my patients th- thusly. And then, again, in, in their perimenopause, it's very important. Um, I tell them that once, you know, and we didn't really get into an estrogen conversation, um, because it's not wasn't the right time, but I could talk to you again for hours on estrogen uh, replacement. Yes. Um, I'm very pro it uh, for the you know right patient, obviously. But what um, what I tell patients is this, and then all of a sudden they listen to me. I say to you, do you know why someone gets admitted to a nursing home? And the top three reasons that someone gets admitted to a nursing home, and then all of a sudden they sit up and they like lean a little bit, a little bit closer. Okay, and you can tell from the body language that they're they're keyed in. And the first one is dementia. Yep. Okay. The second one is immobility. And the third one is not being able to, to care for themselves, um, um, you know, urination, uh, their faculties, right? And they need uh, to, to help. Um, so those are the three reasons. And we do know that immobility is fracturing a hip is from bone loss when they're not, yeah. they're not exercising at a younger age or not tr- eating the right calcium or not having the right estrogen. You know, not having and so PCOS, although actually puts you at a lower risk because it, it it have, have higher levels of, of estrogen in their life, but they are at risk for that if they if they become immobile because of you know obesity or whatnot. So strength and, and you know exercise and strength training and being stronger and having more muscles um, is and if you have more muscles, they w- muscle weighs more than fat. Okay, right. so, so don't I, I tell those patients get rid of the scale. Yeah, I don't even want them to look at the scale. Um, so, so, and then the, the pelvic floor, um, if, if they're not working on it and doing the exercises as a young, younger patient, it gets much harder, um, down the road. Um, and then the dementia issue, uh, of, of the patients with PCOS and type two diabetes can have a higher risk of developing dementia later on. So, so they, they listen and they start making positive changes and I'm not asking them to build, you know, an empire state building overnight. I want them to make meaningful small meaningful changes that actually build over time that's yeah. all and that's what i that's what i try to impart upon them um and uh and get away from the one pill fix all mentality because that'll do more damage um that'll do more damage you know i'd love to talk to you at length about like ozempic and and if it's good or if it's bad but um you know i i, I think we can we can go down that rabbit hole because that's a very deep and interesting rabbit hole it you know it, and we'll just we'll, we'll we'll just do this top just a teaser and then we'll, I'm going to bring you back on that one, but the one there's a a, a doctor out there, uh, Doctor Tina, I can't think of her last name right now, but she she's coming at it from a different angle that I think is very interesting. She's coming at it as you mentioned inflammation, and inflammation is really challenging for a lot of people to control in their body. And she's looking at Ozempic as a anti-inflammatory versus a pure weight loss. And she's looking at it like in- inflammation in your brain, inflammation, you know, in your organs, though, that yeah. sort of thing, which, you know, if you put that spin on it versus like Kim Kardashian wants to fit into a dress for the Oscars. Right, right, right. It, you know, so you're just kind yeah. of like you're seeing both sides of it. So it's a very yeah, interesting, yeah, yeah, it's an yeah. interesting drug. It, it, it is a very interesting drug. Um, I just, again, to put a very top line, I think it has wonderful, wonderful potential for the right patient. Yes. Okay. And to reverse a lot of things that they've been struggling with their whole life. Um, I think, uh, I think that uh, Ozempic babies is, is a fascinating topic to discuss on how that's happening. These patients who didn't realize they were, con- you know, able to conceive when they were told they were infertile and then all of a sudden they're conceiving. Um, uh, I think it's it's wonderful. I think it's a little scary at times because Ozempic is not approved for pregnancy. But but uh, but, but it also talks about this. what you said, the inflammation, right? So if I've been yeah. like struggling with inflammation and all the steps I haven't been able to do, shocker. Right. Yeah, yeah. But again, I wouldn't rely on that one shot fix yeah, all. No, you know? agreed, I agreed. Yeah, but if you're but someone I, who's I, if you've done the steps, yeah, yeah. I just I just you know I, I I'm cautious. When something is too good to be true, it often is too good to be true. So I'm a little bit cautious and scary. 
So I just I just want to like take some deep breaths, work on the seven pillars. I was never right. going to do that seventh pillar, but just uh, but just definitely um, make sure you're doing everything else too. Right. It, it, it's the it's like um, you got to nail the basics, right? You didn't just become a doctor. You didn't say, you know what? I think I'm going to become a guy today. I get a white coat, <laughs> and all of a sudden I, I'm in I'm in practice. Like you had to take the steps to get there, and. I always tell people like, you know, like when you get pregnant and you know, I can't go into and be like, you know what? I know you said nine months, but could we get this done in six? Like I got some right. other things I need done <laughs> down the line. You would laugh in my face if I said I need this done in six months. <laughs> yeah. 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 I know. It's just, uh, unfortunately it's the mentality that we have to kind of as society, um, evolve out of. Uh, we evolved into it because of technology, and we became better at what we did and more efficient at what we did. But unf- unfortunately, there's some, you know, there's some broken down cars and carcasses on on the side of the road uh, because yes, of it. So let's absolutely, so that, you know, focusing. Sometimes the the path is part of the journey, um, and it is the journey, not just the end. For sure. So, you know, I ask everyone when I end my podcast, what's one thing that makes you feel magical? Um, I, I think actually patient gratitude. Ah. Uh, I actually patient gratitude that um, it, it doesn't even have to be much. I just feel like when a patient acknowledges me and says, you know, thanks me, like there was a patient and I went, you know, not that I went out of the way, but I, I, I helped her with something, you know, she brought me a bottle of wine and I didn't, it wasn't expected or anything like that, but just, uh, it's it just it's very nice to like be appreciated for what I'm trying to do um mm. and 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 you know you know or doc, even a patient saying you know Dr. White someone's ever spoken to me like that before uh, yes that helped that's very helpful um and and again I'm not saying anything that you probably didn't know <laughs> you know but just my years of experience has said you know uh, you know I can share I can share with you one thing that happened to me and I, I'll end on this I had a, uh, oh, I'll leave it up to you, but I had, uh, I was sitting at a wedding once and this couple sitting next to my wife and myself leaned over to me and said, you know, Dr. Weiss, you saved my daughter's life. You saved our daughter's life. And I don't talk about patients outside of the office. I don't, I don't even recognize them. I don't even know who their daughter was. Right. I didn't know I took care of their daughter. And I said, you know, if you want to share, please share. I'd love to hear what did I do that was a positive in this, in this woman's life. And so, and so I said something to her about exercising after she ate. Oh. The thing that I spoke about earlier. Yeah, and yeah. At that point, it was before I had my polished, you know, seven pillars development story. And, all <laughs> and I, just, I was saying these things and I was just saying, do this, do that, do that, do that, and exercise after you eat one in the one hour. And I said, the reason why, and I, I quit, gave it to her basically as, as we were finishing up and as she was walking out, that was the one thing that she did and internalized. She lost weight. She menstruated. She got pregnant. She got married. Every, everything about her life turned around. Oh, wow. She was like, depressed and she turned that around and it, everything just turned around and i felt like wow my words mean something and again not to say that i just i didn't have it in the past but it it like that was that aha moment and and i like that that question of that you just asked so what made me feel magical and i really feel like that was a magic moment um and so and and so now i've, I've upped my game in terms of communications with patients and it's funny because it's like you never know that one thing you say to a patient, you know, right. you're like, you've probably right. said that tip a thousand times. And More. the fact that <laughs> like the, this one person, you know, took in that tip and implemented it. And now like yeah. they have the life and you're just like, wow, like that is like me. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And it reemphasized why I went into medicine, specifically OBGYN and women's health, um, helping patients with their entire life cycle, um, and not just being a surgeon for hernia or whatnot or gallbladder, like really seeing these patients o- over and over and, and helping them live their best lives and really thriving. And that's what I'm trying to accomplish. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for your time today. And Magic Makers, feel free to reach out to him. I'm going to uh, put his uh, all of his social stuff, all of his website on um, in the show notes. Um, you know, grab uh, some of his supplements. Like if you're spending $400 a month and you just want it all yeah. in one pill, <laughs> like, grab some of his supplements. And absolutely. Oh, are you? Do you see patients uh, virtually, or do I have to be see yeah. in person? You see. So no, you see on, patients- on our yeah on our website probationlife.com. You can. You can uh, order a 15 minute or half hour, um, uh, what do you call it, <laughs> visit. 
Yeah. So absolutely. So if you've been that person who's been that tough to diagnose, like this is your guy, that, that's his jam is to help those of you who mm-hmm. are tough to diagnose. All right, Dr. Weissman, as well, Dr. Weiss, sorry. Thank you so much for your time. It has been awesome having you on and you've just given me, I've, I've been taking notes. So it's been <laughs> absolutely awesome having you on the show today. I appreciate it so much, Kim. And just keep up the positive energy. I love the energy. I love the message. I love the the momentum. Um, and I know, I know for a fact uh, you're helping people out there and keep it up. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Fit Girl Magic Podcast. If you've made it this far, yay. I'm thinking you enjoyed the show. Let's continue the conversation on Instagram. You can find me at Kim Jefferson Coach. In order for me to keep sharing this message, do me a favor and leave me a five-star review on iTunes. While you're there, don't forget to subscribe so that you won't miss an episode. New episodes are available every Wednesday. The Fit Girl Magic Podcast is intended to provide you with tips, tools, and strategies that will help you make better decisions about your health. I really appreciate your feedback and your support. Thank you so much. Bye.